Dr. Anthony Pinn has a resume that could be published as its own book. And he has a new book coming out, and I want to talk about that. But quickly, just a few bullet points. He is a professor of religion. He holds degrees from Harvard, Columbia University, and others. He is the director of research for the Institute of Humanist Studies. He's a fellow at the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He has authored so many books, including 1995's Why Lord, Suffering and Evil in Black Theology, 2005's The African American Religious Experience in America, and most recently just released The Black Practice of Disbelief, an introduction to the principles, history, and communities of black non-believers. Dr. Anthony Penn, welcome back. It's good to see you. Hey, Seth, always good to be with you. Dr. Penn, in so many ways, on a conversation about black humanism, I'm obviously on the outside looking in, right? I'm a white American male. But, I, you know, the questions I have really do come from um, a desire to understand. Sure. I, want, I want to know more. What was it Maya Angelou said? You know, when we know more, we, or we know better, we do better. I'm mm -hmm. paraphrasing. So along with my legitimately sincere and heartfelt questions, I'm going to throw out some devil's advocate Tucker Carlson questions just because <laughs> I want to throw them out there so we can address them and kind Go of lay those it. cards on the table, if that's all right. Um, before we get to black humanism, let's start with a hot one about the cultural conversation that we're having on CRT, critical race theory. The Fox Newsers. Most of, if not, I would say almost all of the American Republican Party says that critical race theory should not be taught. Uh, CRT itself is racism. It asserts that all white people are racist, that we should be ashamed of our proud American heritage. It's divisive identity politics, and it further divides us along racial lines. Critical race theory. First of all, what is it? Well, it's a conversation that wants us to be sensitive to the ways in which difference has been disregarded within the context of the United States, the ways in which race isn't simply something that we experience on the individual level. Uh, it, it, critical race theory is arguing that the very structure of the United States, the political, the legal structure of the United States is defined by racial disregard, that to understand how the U.S. works is to understand a preoccupation with race. So if I am born into the United States in the year 1968, am I born into then a racist system? You are born into a system that has differentiated based upon race. And an element of that is anti-Black racism. And the major driving force of anti-Black racism in the context of the United States has been the enslavement of African peoples, the marginalization of Native Americans, and the list goes on. So yes, to be born in the 1960s, and I'm also born in the 1960s, we were born into a system that is decidedly racist. Another hot button, maybe even as devil's advocate question. I didn't oppress you. I haven't impressed anybody. I mean, I, I'm like, I'm not my ancestors. There's this idea that I have kind of an inherited white guilt and somehow it's my fault. The sins of the fathers, a kind of original sin for the racists of my past who were white. How would you address that one, sir? It, it seems to me what we have to recognize is, yes, in 2024, white people are not directly enslaving people of African descent, but they continue to benefit from that original sin. That original sin put in place structures of white privilege that give white folks in this country the upper hand, and we have to acknowledge that. So to be able to look at the system fairly and say, boy, I got a pretty good deal, it's not being told I have to feel guilty it's acknowledging the reality that my accident of birth actually allowed the doors to open for me much more quickly and easily than for oh, other oh, people. Is that a, another way to certainly. rephrase it to make sure I'm understanding? And, and some will argue, well, 
some will argue, well, look, I'm white and I'm not doing particularly well, right? I'm struggling. I'm living paycheck to paycheck. But we're not talking about what happens on the level of individuals. We're talking about what has happened in a way that is systematic, what has happened on the level of collectives. Okay, let's talk about systemic racism and law enforcement. The murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis was another lightning rod in the calls for reform, better education, training, accountability, red flags to root out the bad apples. But after the George Floyd murder, we saw these defund the police hashtags springing up everywhere. And this was kind of the jello that couldn't be nailed to the wall. I, everybody had a different definition. I, from my perspective, some people said, no, I'm talking about reform. We need better social services. You know, we, everybody doesn't need to run in with a gun when there's this specific problem or that one. And other people were like, screw it. The whole system's broken. Wipe out the cops and start from square one. What's your perspective on defund the police? I'd say two things. One, we have to recognize how police policing uh, in the contemporary moment came to be, right? You can directly link contemporary policing to much older slave patrols. So this develops in a way that problematizes populations, right? That assumes a dilemma. That's the first thing. Secondly, I think we have to recognize within the context of any community, Traumatic events, traumatic encounters are not always best handled through what the police force offers, that there are mental health issues that police officers are ill-equipped to handle. So what we need are other forms of monitoring communities that don't assume the same sort of antagonistic relationship that you get with the police force, that we need other ways of handling communities that recognize that at a fundamental level, what we have to get at are issues of mental and physical well-being. And again, those are not best addressed through police forces. I also find it interesting, the reductive nature of much of this argument, especially, I don't think I'm too biased to say, especially on the right, when it's, I support the police, right? I mean, it's just a bumper sticker. This idea that it's all or nothing, it's binary. You are either pro-police or you're an enemy of law and order. Have you seen that? I, I've seen that, um, but I think there's a better way to phrase that. What I would say is I am pro-well-being. I am pro-safety. I am pro-flourishing, right? And then the question becomes, what do we need to put in place to safeguard well-being, to make certain that diverse communities prosper. Christopher Rufo is a journalist for the Manhattan Institute for Policy Research. They go hard promoting Reagan conservatism, free market, laissez-faire capitalism, etc. He's been pounding the drum of broken windows theory. This theory claims that after police officer Darren Wilson shot Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, back in 2014, and then the unrest and the protest and even the riots followed, police are now walking on eggshells. They are so nervous that they are going to prompt outrage, end up on TikTok, maybe even in a court of law, that they are tepid, they're hesitant, even weak in the face of criminal activity. What's your take on this broken windows theory that's being proffered up by the Heritage Foundation, et cetera? I think that is completely inaccurate, completely inaccurate. And it seems to me what we might want to value in this scenario is a need for police officers to think twice before they use deadly force. Right to think twice before using deadly force, but to also recognize that not every scenario encountered requires the kind of force that they represent, that some of what they encounter within communities requires the help of a social worker, requires the help of a psychiatrist, requires the help of a doctor, and that you don't resolve those by pulling out a gun. Dr. Anthony Penn is my guest today, professor and author of The Black Practice of Disbelief, an introduction to the principles, history, and communities of black nonbelievers. Can I do one more hot button Tucker Carlson Go question? Would that be okay? 
in the book, you get into the Black Lives Matter movement. And I recently saw a charge made by the Heritage Foundation that one of the founders of Black Lives Matter is a self-described trained Marxist. And so as such, Black Lives Matter is not a racial equality movement. It is a covert political force that wants to strip Americans of their freedom and turn us all into a Marxist, even a Soviet state. How do you address that, sir? It's sad, but amusing, right? That this sort of argument coming from folks who are okay with the dictator tendencies of a Donald Trump. But I think what they, it's willful ignorance, what they fail to speak to, what they fail to acknowledge is that Black Lives Matters understands itself to be a leader full movement. It doesn't boil down to the dictates, the whims, the desires, the wants of a particular strata of leaders, that it understands itself to be guided by the mass of folks who are involved in these efforts. And so the inclinations of any particular figure within Black Lives Matter doesn't define the overall movement. It seems to be the kind of machine, almost like the, I I hate the word movement for atheist movement, but okay, uh, it applies, I think, with Black Lives Matter, that it's a machine that operates as a whole, but the gears also operate independently on their own. Oh, sure, sure. And the way, again, the way they name this understanding, their their process is, it, it involves a push against hierarchical forms of, of leadership, of structure. And instead they understand that they are leaderful, F-U-L-L, right? That everyone involved in this has equal voice, has the capacity and the right to determine what takes place. It isn't dependent upon a couple of well-spoken individuals. From the book's introduction, you say, according to popular imagination in the United States, to be a black American is to be a black Christian. Let's start there. Why the assumption that there is the connection between black and Christian? A a couple of points on, on that. One, black churches have had tremendously wonderful PR. Right. So they've crafted a narrative of black life that has made black churches indispensable, that you cannot have black life without black churches. We live in the context of a country that understands itself through a Christian narrative. And so the way in which the history, the practices, the experience of populations it's read and understood is filtered through the assumption of Christianity. So we find what we're looking for. We look at the United States, we assume Christianity, so that's what we find. It's also the case that for a significant percentage of black people who respond to surveys, understand themselves as believing in God, attending church services on some basis that could be understood as regular attendance, right? And so we take from this sort of information the assumption that all Black people are Christian. And if all Black people aren't Christian, they are at the very least theist. You think this is about community, not theology? I mean, maybe, you know, I'm I'm comforted by the belief in God, but mostly I just want to belong. Well, Seth, there's something that's really important for me. I make a distinction between religion and theism. I believe all forms of theism are religious, but not all religions are theistic, right? So this is why you could get someone like Carl Jung arguing that religion is really the symbolic expression of life life meaning, or Durkheim who argues that it's a force for cohesion. It's a way of giving people a sense of belonging within the context of community. Or even that theologian from the 20th century, Paul Tillich, who argued that religion revolves around two things, ultimate concern and ultimate orientation. None of these folks demand that an understanding of religion entail God or gods. And so I would argue that religion is really a process for working to make life meaningful. It's a it's a tool for meaning making. It does not require God or gods. So for some folks, their participation is theologically driven. It is 
based upon an allegiance to divine forces interacting in the world. But for other folks, yes, it is a matter of community. It is a matter of the like-minded trying to make their way in a world that is absurd. I think it was Dr. Robert Sapolsky in a conversation he and I had recently, he called it social glue. I think that's a pretty good term. You know, it it's a connecting force between mm -hmm. human beings. It provides structure and ritual, et cetera. I get frustrated with some of my fellow atheist activists with these massive overgeneralizations. In the meme verse, religion is this, or religion is that. Well, there are thousands upon thousands of different religions, probably even more than that, if you splinter under those religious expressions, rituals, traditions, values, opinions, cultures, the secular religions, like the satanic temple, and people try to cram it all into a box and then crush the box, <laughs> you know. But in your book, you call black humanism a religion. Can you explain? Yes, yes, yes. But first, let me say, uh, in, in terms of what you were just saying, isn't it odd that people who pride themselves on being reason-driven and logical would exercise such sloppy thought when it comes to the nature and meaning of religion? Theists have claimed it, and so they say, yeah, we don't do that because the theists say they are religious, so we can't be without understanding the complexities involved. So I call black humanism a religion. And in, this is in no way to say that black humanists believe in God or gods. It's to say that black humanism is a system that is deeply concerned with making life meaningful, that black humanism is a way to wrestle with the fundamental questions of human existence. Who are we? When are we? What are we? Why are we? And to ritualize our wrestling with those issues. And too many non-theists say, well, no, I'm not involved in, in ritual and I don't care about life meaning. That's just, that's ridiculous. Ritual is simply repeated activity in founded space. So every time Atheists load up their suitcase on that plane to go to a convention. They are involved in ritual. Every time a humanist packs up to go to the American Humanist Association to participate in that conference, they are involving themselves in ritual. I don't like the idea that we surrender to the church, the idea of community, no. this idea that human connection and structure, I call ritual kind of the frame for the portrait of human existence. You know, it allows us, to, it's, it's our plumage. You know, I think it's expression. I think it gives color and culture and life and, and so much beauty to uh, the moments that we have on this earth. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and there's something about the grammar and vocabulary of, of religion that non-theists ought to rethink and value that there's something about a grammar of religion that allows us to better understand and interrogate our sense of wonder and awe in the world. And all of this can be horizontal. That is to be concerned with what takes place within the context of human history. It doesn't require anything that's vertical. That is a, a belief in cosmic forces that are interacting with us. No, we can all take place within the context of our material existence, but a religious vocabulary and grammar gives us a different way to wrestle with a sense of awe and wonder. And it also does this, and this is really important. A whole lot of black folks who leave theism lose family and friends. And humanist communities have to constitute a soft place to land. And a soft place to land cannot simply involve a celebration of science and separation of church and state and a belittling of theists. It's got to involve more than that. Uh, but for it to involve more than that, we have to rethink what humanist community entails. I've thought about uh, the evolution of my own activism. Of course, I was pretty angry, I, and for good reason. When I came out of the faith, I felt like I'd wasted time. I was mad at myself. Uh, I felt like nobody was listening. There's a whole bunch of baggage there. But over the course of time, it became less about cursing the darkness and more about spreading some light. Instead, you know, I'm not going to focus to totally on what I don't believe in. What do I believe in? What, what am I about? Exactly. What are my values? What kind of world do I want to build? And that would be humanism exactly. from your exactly. perspective. But does saying religion as a secular humanist 
thing? Does that give cover to religious people? Because you know they're folding their arms and they're going, "Uh uh-huh, I told you, everybody's religious, even those atheists, right? I mean, are we we giving them ammo, giving them a pass? Only if our thinking is sloppy. Again, we need to make a distinction between religion and theism. That from, from my mind, the point of disagreement, the folks against whom we are trying to build an alternative is the theist, right? The, it's the theist who are promoting a sense of the world, who are promoting a sense of involvement in the world that involves disregard and belittling. Those are, that is the orientation that we are battling against. We have to separate that from religion. And religion, again, is simply a system for wrestling with the fundamental questions of human existence. Who are we? When are we? Why are we? What are we? Oh, no. I mean, and you mentioned this in the book, Oprah Winfrey, Steve Harvey. They would disagree with you. Oprah Winfrey back in 2013 said that you can't feel true awe and wonder if you don't believe in God. Steve Harvey was like, where's your moral barometer? And if you don't believe in God, you're an idiot and he doesn't even want to talk to you. How do you address awe and wonder without God or God? Well, first, I wouldn't be taking advice from Steve Harvey. (laughs) <laughs> you know, that's the first point that needs to be made. You don't want to take Good advice. your advice from Steve Harvey. <laughs> right, but yeah. I, I think there are ways to get at this. If we if we think, for example, in terms of black non-believers, and, and we think in terms of the work that Mandisa Thomas and others involved in that larger organization are trying to do, you get a sense of awe and wonder through collective celebration through a recognition that there is something awe-inspiring. There is something, there, there is something about our mundane engagement, having a meal with folks who are like-minded, right? Just hanging out with folks who are like-minded. That is life-giving, that is affirming, that points to a reality, that points to a worth and a value that extends beyond the simple individual. That There are ways in which that these activities that black humanist organizations are promoting places the individual within the context of the collective. And it is that relationship to the collective that produces a sense of awe and wonder. I am part of something that is bigger and grander than me. Were you once a minister? You were a preacher? Yes, I was a ordained deacon in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Our stories are not dissimilar. I I mean, I was thinking to myself, were you that sort of gentle yet firm, fatherly, scholarly orator behind the, you know, you barely moved. You just simply brought the holy text to the minions or were you like Benny Hinn, you know, where you're running around? What kind of a preacher were you when you were dispensing the good word, Dr. (laughs) Pitt? Well, I grew up in... uh, a couple of congregations in which preaching was somewhat energetic. Now, it wasn't Pentecostal energetic, but it was energetic, right? There was passion involved. So there was movement, right? There was movement. It wasn't monotone. It wasn't stay behind the pulpit. There was movement. Walk down the aisles, walk across the the pulpit structure, right? There was a whole lot of energy involved in this. I used to do a lot of video production. We did some uh, videos for a lot of African-American churches, which were very experiential. I mean, it was just this weaving in of the music and standing and art and clothing and and expression, the tenor of the voices. It was really, it was a roller coaster ride. So I, that's what I picture in my mind. I don't know if that's fair to your Yeah, experience. there's an assumption that proper worship involves the full body. Right, that everything about us ought to be involved in that process of worship. How did you get out of the pulpit in that way? You went full, you know, from full minister to, I don't buy it. How does that even happen? Well, it, it started when I was a college student. I was a student in New York, um, and I'd come from Buffalo, New York, and attended a rather a small conservative high school. It was a feeder program for institutions like Bob Jones University, right? So you get a sense of the theology that was involved. I get to New York and it's a very different world. I'm encountering faculty members who think the Bible is just a piece of literature. Can you imagine this? Just a piece of literature. I'm I'm encountering folks who are involved in different religious traditions and they're not 
they're not afraid of the hellfire I'm telling them they're going to encounter. And I'm working at a church in Bedford-Stuyvesant, and I'm in New York as crack cocaine is beginning to take over. And so death is all around us. And nothing about what we preached made a felt difference. And it started raising questions for me concerning the usefulness of my theology. And these questions continued as I was a graduate student. And it reached a point where I just didn't believe what I was expected to preach. And I was willing to be a lot of things, but I wasn't going to be a hypocrite. So I couldn't be in the pulpit preaching a gospel I no longer held as true. So I contacted the minister who was in charge of the church in in Boston where I was working and contacted my bishop and said that I was surrendering ordination, that I did not believe and I could not be involved in ministry. For me, it wasn't personal. It wasn't because I asked for something and God didn't give it to me. It was the larger structure of life that people were suffering. There was so much misery in the world. I could not reconcile that misery in the world with any sort of divine presence. It was just us. And we had a tendency to screw things up. So did these sort of spiritual authorities call out the proverbial fire trucks, you know, to rescue your hellbound heathen soul? I mean, did, did they did they circle the wagons around you? Or well, what? initially they didn't believe that I was I was real, right? That this, that I was just angry for a moment, I'd get over it, but I did not come back. And I was, I was more fortunate than a whole lot of folks who leave theism. You know, I lost some friends, but whatever. My mother's response was, and my mother had gone into ministry after me. My mother's response was, look, I I hope you come back, but Even if you don't, it does not matter. You are my son. I love you. We are blood. Don't worry. Right. And that was the general response I got. Okay. Okay. Whatever. So unlike a whole lot of folks, I didn't really, I didn't experience profound isolation. I didn't experience folks beating me up because I no longer believed that that just wasn't my experience, I, my professional life was not threatened. I was going not into ministry any longer, but into the academy where questioning was appreciated, where there was no assumption that I had to believe anything about the traditions, personally believe anything about the traditions I was going to explain and explore in the classroom. Speaking here with professor, author, and educator, Dr. Anthony Penn, you mentioned surveys of black non-believers. Because of the cultural, social consequences, maybe even financial consequences, if their employers are religious, you feel like more people on these anonymous surveys will mark non-believer, atheist, than they would ever say out in public? You think when nobody's looking, those numbers go up? I, I think lots of folks are suspicious of these surveys. Um, but even beyond that, think, think about it this way. After the civil rights movement, Christian congregations in the United States experience a period of decline, white and black, a period of decline. For the black church, there's not an uptick until the mid 1980s when members of the black middle class are frustrated. They've played by the rules. They've done everything they were told to do in order to be successful. They lived in the right neighborhoods, went to the right schools, dressed the right way, had the right set of friends, but racism still hampered their progress. And they had given up so much of their cultural legacy. They came back to churches, not because they believed the theology, but because of the social networking. They went back to churches because it was a space in which you didn't have to explain why you were angry. It was a space in which nobody touched your hair without permission, right? So they could just be just breathe. And if the sermon, if the theology was the price they had to pay for that networking, whatever. But it isn't safe to assume that everybody who moved into these churches were theologically in line with these churches. You had a whole lot of skeptics, free thinkers, humanists, atheists hiding out in these churches because of the social benefits. And so it seems to me that this continues. What we will get in more recent surveys is more folks being willing to say, nah, that theism thing isn't for me. I'm I'm not really into this religion thing. That's not what I do. So 
the pulpit preachers and many of the true believers, the theistic believers, they embrace the Bible, right? They're waving the Bible, the Bible of slaves and people bought and sold and harmed and killed in the name of God. Is this not a celebration of one's own chains in some way? Oh, oh certainly. And that, and think about it this way. For people of African descent, there is nothing about the Bible that wipes out the moral and ethical correctness of servitude within the context of the Bible is simply a matter of who is the servant. It's not that some folks shouldn't be disadvantaged. It's a question of who should be disadvantaged, that nothing about this biblical text speaks a moral and ethical vision that is in line with a sense of fullness and well-being that we say we want. It restricts, it banishes, and it celebrates disregard. We need other sources of insight. And so for my money, African Americans, rather than taking their marching order from the Hebrew Bible or the New Testament, ought to read James Baldwin, Alice Walker, Toni Morrison, Lorraine Hansberry, right? There are a host of folks who speak from their experience and from their experience, try to project a different way to live into fullness, into well-being. I didn't know about a lot of secular human rights activists until I had conversations with people like Mendisa Thomas. And I was like, really? Frederick Douglass and Hubert Harrison and W.E.B. Du Bois yes. and all these other people. I mean, we always talked about Martin Luther King Jr., right? The reverend was out there and he was uh, invoking God, but there were so many others who did not invoke the name of the Lord. Oh, yeah. I mean, that, and you can go further back. So, for example, the spirituals, an early form of music in the United States is premised upon a theistic understanding of the world. It's black folks trying to understand their circumstances in relationship to a divine presence. But as old as the spiritual are the blues, don't think 1920 race records, as old as the spirituals are the blues that are much more materially driven, that raise questions concerning theological claims, that make fun of theistic moral and ethical restrictions. And it just advances from there. For as long as there have been people of African descent in North America, there have been people of African descent who have said theism doesn't work for me. But again, when we look at this history, we tend to assume theism. We tend to assume Christianity and we find what we're looking for. But there's a long history, and it, it doesn't end with a Martin Luther King Jr. Think in terms of a Huey Newton, for example, or a James Weldon Johnson. James Weldon Johnson, who writes what folks call the Black National Anthem. He also writes a book called uh, God's Trombones. And folks say, ah, oh, he's writing about sermons. He must be born again. He must be Christian. No, he says as a college student, he gave up belief in God, but he understood that there was something of value, not in the content of sermons, but in the style of presentation, right? And so we tend to make that mistake that if black folks mention church, they must be theist. But someone like Huey Newton argues that there's some value to the church, right? And think of Huey Newton, Black Power and the Black Panthers. He says there's some value to the church, but it's, it's based upon the physical space and its ability to use resource to the benefit of black folks. Now, does the church always do that? No, but he says it has the potential. But for him, belief in God was a marker of human ignorance. And as human knowledge increases, the need to rely on God to answer questions decreases. I never realized that about the blues. Really, the blues was kind of tweaking the clerics. Oh, making fun, way. right? Because the blues celebrate everything that the that black theists found morally and ethically objectionable, right? The ways in which bodies give and receive pleasure. Everything black theists find objectionable, the blues celebrate. 
black theists are understanding suffering in a way that makes sense, no sense to folks with the blues. So the blues are raising questions concerning human misery and not attempting to resolve human misery and suffering through belief in God, but rather to address human suffering through protest. Are you still involved with the UU Church, the Unitarian Universalists? I, I do some work with the Unitarian Universalist Association. I'm on the panel on theological education, for example. Um, and there are things I deeply appreciate about the UUA and things I find less than appealing. But my introduction to the UUA was from William R. Jones, who wrote a book in 1973, Is God a White Racist? It's an early academic celebration of black humanism. He was a member of the UUA. And so through my conversations with him, I saw some possibilities there that as as an academic who was still interested in theology, the UUA gave me a way to do that and to do it from a secular vantage point. When I first came out as an atheist, I first showed my face. It was at a UU church. No judgment, open tent, come as you are, which I just love. And I may understand what frustrates you because I worry that it's such an open tent that the ministers are not, they, they will not take the step to reveal or admit something is wrong or debunked or false or maybe even destructive because they don't want to threaten the open tent or make anyone feel unwelcome. I had a UU minister on and I'm like, if somebody walks in and they say, I'm a flat earther, are you prepared at any point to say, that's crazy <laughs> or, or it's, at least it's false? And I think she was more worried about making someone feel unwelcome. Do we worry about having that open mind that is so open that the brain falls out? Yeah, kind of I, I think for members of the UUA, the bottom line is, does your thought and do your practices line up with the fundamental principles that animate the UUA? Part of the frustration for me is that Sunday experience, right? I, I just can't get with it. It seems to me, based upon UU principles, Sunday is the least important day of the week. Their principles revolve around human interaction, how we, how we move to make this world a better place. Sunday is the least important day. That should be a kind of reporting back, get new strategies, and then you go back into Monday and do better work. But if you, from my vantage point, if you go to a typical UU, you know, UU service and you don't listen, you just watch, there's very little that distinguishes it from Sunday performance in a sure enough theistic church. And, and so for me, there is a disconnect between UU thought and UU gathering. That's a whole other show, isn't it? I mean, I just had that digression. You and I could probably have lunch and talk about the UUs. As we draw to a close, and I want everybody to check out the book. It is beautifully written. It is so well articulated. Uh, and I'll put that link in the description box. November looms large. We've got white supremacists and other hate groups who feel empowered to step out of the shadows even more recently you know we've seen them protesting on bridges and out in front of disneyland of all places and they're out you know in, in washington dc we've got the internet information silos disinformation silos of conspiracy and division i think hope feels like a unicorn these days dr penn i'm i'm struggling to find the hope tens of millions of people are rooting for the destruction of democracy and decency. And I don't know how what the future holds. Will you sit back with, you know, smoking your philosophy pipe <laughs> and you're examining the world in your mind and heart? Do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I'm not one who uses the language of hope. Um, I, I don't think there's anything about the history of the United States that suggests hope. For me, hope is too outcome driven that instead I talk in terms of the persistence of possibility. And, and with that, there's a recognition that things don't necessarily get better because we want them to, or that we sure enough work hard to make them better. It, it isn't necessarily the case that 
that things will get better. That I think one of the things we have to recognize, particularly as, as, as humanists, as non-theists, is that it may be the case that the best we can do is to point out injustice, to name injustice with increased volume and persistence, and in that way, make it more difficult to normalize the suffering of folks. That that may be the best we can do. I also think that it's important for us to recognize that November is a reflection of a longer history of hate, disregard, and nastiness that marks out and shapes the narrative of life within the context of the United States. And because this is tied to the very nature of our nation, it becomes our responsibility to recognize that the struggle for justice, the struggle for well-being is ongoing. It's not one and done. And I talk about Trump and I don't know, everybody from Pastor Jim Jeffress to Matt Goetz to any Christian nationalist, I always say that they're both problem and symptom, right? They're a black light at the scene. They have, if nothing else, revealed uh, a much wider, deeper problem, the evidence that these attitudes, they infect us. They are the cancer that is everywhere. I guess if there's any utility in Trumpism, it has been to expose the cancer. Yeah, it, it seems to me that what you get with the presidency of Donald Trump and a potential second term is a clumsy reboot of the system post Obama. But it doesn't point out anything, as you're saying, it doesn't point out anything new. It's just a more vulgar and crude expression of disregard that has shaped so much of the U.S. narrative from the very beginning to the present. And it doesn't mean we don't love our country when we admit that we have real problems. <laughs> I don't know why this idea that it's a betrayal. Like if you have a if you have a child or a sibling or a, a spouse or a parent who is has problems and you want to see those problems addressed and fixed, you acknowledge the issues and want desperately to see them resolved. You're not acting out of hate or betrayal. You're not traitorous to that person. I think a, a healthy expression of love says, "We got a problem. How do we fix it? How do we see them or it?" you know, become the, the best, the most ideal version exactly. of themselves. I don't know, it sounds like a nursery rhyme, but uh, that's my take on it, Dr. Penn. I, I think yours? that's absolutely right, that anything we love, we want it to be its best self. And so within the context of this nation, loving it, it seems to me, involves pointing out its shortcomings, pointing out its failures, and providing strategies for allowing it to be better. Amen. Preach on, Pastor <laughs> Penn. But preach on. Preach. I hear the good word. No, I can I can actually picture you on stage. And I think I might have actually been there. I would have attended that church. I would have visited. And you could have passed the plate and not have been there. Dr. Anthony Penn, author of The Black Practice of Disbelief, an introduction to the principles, history, and communities of black non-believers. I'm a fan. I just think you are amazing and a critical, necessary, and wonderful voice out there. And the fact that you would give me an hour of your time is just I'm just honored. So thanks for being here and good luck with the book. Best wishes. And if we can serve you in any way, you have your people, call our people. Sounds okay, great. So the appreciation is mutual. Wonderful chatting with you.